information war. Al Shones back live. There is a war on for your mind. Al Gore in 2007 and in 2009 on record, we'll show you some screenshots of these news articles, said that the Arctic, the North Pole, would be completely melted, completely melted in winter by 2013. It's expanded and is the thickest uh, in many, many decades being recorded. The Northern Hemisphere has seen record cold temperatures across the board. Temperature records have been smashed all across North America. It goes on and on and on. And Pierce Corbett in the last five years has come on a few times a year, and we appreciate it. He's the owner and operator of Weather Action, a um, very powerful uh, web um, presence exposing what's happening. Uh, he heads up weatheraction.com, and he's been featured on Fox News, BBC, you name it. Uh, many other uh, news programs for accurately predicting what would happen 30, 45, 60 days in advance and sometimes six months to a year uh, ahead dealing with the solar winds and the moon and how that affects climate. Now, the U.N. says that's not the case. It's your car. and you got to pay them money and they'll save you. But they've been fully discredited, but they don't care. They're still moving forward. So he predicted record cold temperatures a year ago on this show and then about six months ago on this broadcast. He's back to tell us how he was able to predict that. And then coming up in the next segment, he's going to tell us what he sees for the spring, what he sees for the summer into the fall and next year. Looking into not a crystal ball, but into the heavens and that big ball of gas, that huge nuclear reactor burning in the sky uh, that actually drives our climate. Pierce, thanks for coming on. Thank you. It's great to be on your show, Alex. Great to have you. This is a short segment, long segment coming up. Yep. Uh, how did you predict it all as usual? Well, we uh, understand uh, uh, in a predictable way the key things the sun is going to do and how the moon will modulate the uh, particles coming from the sun in what is called the solar wind, the rush of particles which comes at a million miles an hour. And uh, the sun-earth connection is primarily magnetic and the moon's modulation of it is magnetic. So we can ascertain when similar sun-earth magnetic states happened in the past as will take place sometime in the future. And we use the weather in the past to predict the future. So these um, very extreme events in uh, Europe and in America were things that had happened in the general terms in the past, and uh, we use those as the uh, predictors. And that includes things like this polar vortex, which is a kind of, uh, well, media term, if you like, but uh, th that type of very cold weather has happened before in the, in the USA. Well, when my dad was a little boy, it was a lot colder than it even is now. But now Indeed. it's going now it's going back towards being cold again. That's right. That's right. Are we in danger of slipping back into a mini ice age, as many people think? We are. Yes. The uh, big variations in the jet stream, which is this kind of guiding uh, thing behind where the low pressure systems track. These are these. It now goes up to the north and down to the south in great big long deep waves, and this is a characteristic of mini ice ages. Um, so it means on average the northern hemisphere is colder with longer, colder winters, late springs um, and wet summers, uh, but some, in some places sometimes it's also going to be very mild um, uh, where the jet stream is going, taking warm air northwards. And for example, the British Isles now is in fact in, in such a situation, so we've got a, a mild winter whereas you've got an astoundingly cold uh, episodes happening in, in the, well, in most, many parts of the USA, but especially the north, central, and northeast parts. Amazing. Um, and again, you don't like to toot your horn, but you do have the reports from last year. And well, absolutely, yes, yes. And interestingly, of course, the warmest have got nothing to say except lie, and I do mean lie. They, they claim, oh, yes, uh, this is all CO2. Now, I was at a meeting last year in October in the Royal Society in London where the IPCC, that's the United Nations Climate Committee, were reporting, you know, to the public and scientists mainly, what's going on. And they said there, there's all these variations in the jet stream happening, uh, we don't know why, and it isn't 
doesn't follow from anything to do with our CO2. More CO2 doesn't make these wild ways in the jet stream. So I stood up and said, well, we predicted these things are going to happen some time ago. We know why it's happening. It's to do with uh, uh, solar lunar uh, effects. And... Uh, uh, that is the only way you can understand these things, certainly not by CO2. Tell you what, stay uh, there. It's simply incredible. And, and uh, people can go to your site and see the published reports from a year ago, six months ago. We had him on. You heard him. He said one whopper of a freezing winter. Get ready. Uh, we're in danger of a new ice age. The InfoWars crew absolutely loves coffee because we love being awake. And I am somewhat of a connoisseur of coffee. So many times you go to a restaurant or even to a coffee shop and the coffee tastes like garbage. And in all the different coffees I've tried, my favorite is grown in the high mountains, in shade, Arabica, on the border with Guatemala in southern Mexico by the Chiapas farmers. I make sure we've done the research. I make sure it's the very best product that we can offer you when I put my name on it. And I believe, and it's my taste, so you may differ, that this is the best coffee in the world from Southern Mexico. Wake Up America Patriot Blend, 100% organic, Arabica shade grown. And then we have the Immune Support 100% organic coffee infused with a special type of mushroom known to boost the immunity. This coffee is seriously so smooth. I normally have to douse my coffee with cream and sugar and cinnamon and all kinds of tasty treats, but this, I drink this black. It is so good. Well, that's why I like it, is that it has a kick, it has really good caffeine in it, it has a good clean wake up that lasts for a long time, doesn't give me a headache, but it's so smooth, it's so delicious. Just try it out for yourself. I'm telling you, this is my favorite coffee. We went through a lot of trouble to bring you this. Just try it, and I think you'll be hooked like we are here at InfoWars. Well, folks, find out for yourself and support the information war today. It's all available at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. Gentlemen, the man who continues year after year to predict the weather accurately, dealing with the sun and the cycles it's going through, is with us. And by the way, I've interviewed many other astrophysicists, scientists, meteorologists who are on record, who who are on record saying the exact same thing. It's, it's not like only Piers Corbin is saying this. He's just very good with the mathematics to break it down for decades. Uh, you know, as a meteorologist, as an astrophysicist at weatheraction.com. But I want to give you the floor for the next 10 minutes, sir. I know your time's important. To present to us the, you know, the fraud of the warmest, how they're wanting to demonize CO2 so they can tax it, while ignoring real environmental issues, and then... Tell us what you think is coming in the future with their movement, how we counter it when we've been proven totally accurate and right. Al Gore has been proven to be a fraud saying polar bears can't swim and that it's all just a power grab. And then tell us, most importantly, what's coming up now uh, where most of our listeners are in the Northern Hemisphere, Europe and uh, the United States, Canada, what we can expect according to past trends with similar solar and lunar activity. Yes, right. Okay, well, two things there. First of all, the CO2 story, or lie, and then secondly, what's happening next? Well, first of all, on the CO2 story, I mean, the reason for it is, as you said, it's a tax-collecting scam, it's uh, social control, uh, it's um, a way of creating a bubble of false value through carbon trading. Um, and there's a lot of people riding on it. So they are prepared to tell lies in order to keep the story going. Um, and that means, for example, that people like me uh, just never get a look in on BBC television, e even though they'll have the other side on uh, all the time talking nonsense. Now, they claim, basically, were, were claiming before that the world was warming due to CO2. Now, the world is not warming. In fact, on real data, it's cooling. And even on their fiddle data, it's not warming. It's staying flat or cooling a little bit. Um, so 
Well, they can't say that anymore. Instead, they talk about climate change. And now we've got all these quite considerable extremes going on. They say that extremes are caused by CO2. Now, this is a lie, and the people who put this forward know it's a lie. Um, because they also know, these scientists, that they cannot explain the variations in the jet stream, which are the root cause of these extremes. Whereas we can, the solar lunar theory can, and we can prove absolutely that it is due to the sun. Because we can predict solar events, coronal holes, big uh, solar flares, and when these are going to happen, and then what will follow. And one thing which follows is at times you have these uh, warmings of the stratosphere. Now, when these warmings of the stratosphere happen, they encourage changes lower down in the uh, troposphere, that is where the weather happens, uh, and bigger variations in the jet stream. And that is what is happening now. We predicted some warmings in the stratosphere. They have happened, or indeed are happening as we speak. Whereas the CO2 people can explain none of this whatsoever. So they know when they say it's CO2, they are lying. And they're going to carry on lying as long as... Uh, um, the uh, governments uh, allow them to and encourage them to and shovel them money in order to lie. So, what can the public do about that? Well, the thing is, you have to demand your politicians only listen to proven science and just say, look, the CO2 people have got no evidence. And if any politician says they have, just say to him, OK, where is it? And you'll be surprised that politicians will then shut up and they'll probably refuse to talk to you. Well, you might get some on your side. And there are, well, in America, there's more politicians sceptical or, you know, will know the CO2 story is a lie and are prepared to say it than in Britain. But we do have a increasing number in Britain, and I think there will be a change at some point, but it has to be worked on. I was about to say, just last week it came out in the news that the BBC has secret meetings with their thousands yes. of news presenters to, uh, of how to defraud the public and keep the lie going. That's right, absolutely, a completely... See, the BBC is meant to be publicly controlled. It's meant to be open, accountable. Now, this was a lie. They had this meeting in January 2006 where they said they had... They were calling together 28 scientific experts to establish beyond any reasonable doubt what was really going on. Actually, there were two scientists present, and the rest were all uh, Greenpeace fraudsters, uh, various people on the gravy train, assorted liars, people of whom I have absolutely zero respect. Um, and there were two scientists who were on the gravy train themselves. Now, of course, that, that meeting wasn't discussing science. It was discussing how to lie, um, which is why the BBC spent huge amounts of effort, legal defences, to prevent who was at this uh, meeting being made. No. Now, the, the judges, judges, to give them their credit, have now said, no, no, BBC can't hide these things, and the list of who was there is public. Now, I, I, I've met three of those people, and, uh, you know, it's very interesting what happened subsequent to that meeting, because... Uh, one of the very interesting things was about the insurance industry in Britain. Uh, we had been predicting floods that had happened in 2007, for example. And the insurance industry has spent £6 million on predicting, uh, on a flood map, flood risk map for Britain, to show when the floods are most likely to happen, where they'll happen, and if they happen, i.e. who's going to be affected. So I phoned them up and said, well, uh, that's a great map you've got. Do you want to know if it's actually going to flood? And they said, no, no, we don't want to know. I said, what? You don't want to know? No, we don't want to know. Now, in the conversation that followed, it was basically the reason they said, well, you're on the wrong bus, Mr. Corbyn. And then you think about it, the reason why they don't want to know is kind of obvious. They are defrauding the public by claiming there's going to be loads of floods. Now, there will be floods, of course, but sometimes. But they want people to buy insurance that they won't use. Um, and, of course, me popping up one year saying, oh, there will be floods this year or there won't be. Uh, would mean that someone who had bought the insurance uh, when the insurance companies knew there was going to be no floods could take them to court, you see, and argue the toss. So they don't want to hear... I remember you were on a couple of years ago talking about the drought in the Midwest in Texas. Yes, and, and, absolutely. And then you predicted... Due to solar activity uh, and and that that the flooding would come soon, and then now we've seen some of the worst flooding on record. Again, how do you do that so accurately? And then a on the time we've got left.